Hello everyone, I'm Layman Pascal in the Integral Stage, and this is the segue teaser or prolegomena into the Embodiment series. Bruce, you've been asked to give a presentation for Stanford, and deservedly so in my opinion. I'm not alone in thinking that the amount of experience and uh, integrity and insight you're sitting on is sorely missing from the world, and institutions are failing at their ostensible mission if they aren't emphasizing, promoting, and supporting your work. So it's nice to see you included in the Contemplation by Design Summit. What, as you understand it, is that, and how did you get involved? It came out of the blue. I, I really didn't know anything about the conference before, but when I got the invitation, I found out it had been from, I think the, the individual who asked me had been watching some of the content on the integral stage, and in fact, had seen some of our dialogues with John Verveke, and was interested in what we were doing in the Rethinking Religion series. And so they wanted to reach out to me and see if I would like to present something at their upcoming conference. The Contemplation by Designs is uh, an event that brings together contemplative practitioners and health practitioners and you know, meditation teachers and things like that to give presentations that are geared towards you know, a modern scientifically literate audience and seeking the engagement of students you know, in the sciences, students in you know, different psychological and other disciplines within the university at Stanford and to see you know, what is the interface, I think in part to just enrich the practice lives of the students there, but also really to explore the intersections of the ancient contemplative arts and modern science, engineering, design, things like that. So you're gonna be presenting some techniques around a subtle embodiment practice, but you're also going to be uh, giving a general talk on post-metaphysical spirituality, is that right? Yes. So what's your, uh, I know we've put a lot of work into this over the years. <laughs> what's, what's your blurb on post-metaphysical spirituality at this moment? How would you sum it up briefly? So there have been a number of movements historically from James and Peirce and later Habermas, um, Jung in between. A lot of people looking at religious phenomena and contemplative phenomena and not brushing it aside simply as religious superstition, but also not uncritically taking it on board, but trying you know, in earnest and with the best of their capacities with their own current and contemporary scientific and psychological understanding to really understand what's going on with these phenomena in a way that doesn't just explain them away or reduce them down to you know, neurological correlates or to simple psychological functions, but that actually gives them a certain ontological dignity that something is happening here that's worth attending to, and we don't know exactly what it is. We can hold the metaphysics behind those things in suspension and experiment practically with them and see what that yields. And so I think overall, that's the spirit of a post-metaphysical approach. It's been carried forward by a number of different thinkers where it's a pragmatic orientation. It, it, holds metaphysical claims in as if status and is, you could say metaphysically pluralist in the sense that it's willing to entertain different ontological explanations for what's going on, but not letting the ontological uncertainty impede engagement, practice, or research, right? So Ken Wilber in his excerpts to the Cosmos trilogy of, of books. He had Sex Ecology, Spirituality, and then he's supposed to be coming out with another book. He began to introduce this term of post-metaphysics and post-metaphysical spirituality. And then he talked about it later in his book, Integral Spirituality, and proposed a particular framing of that. And so largely my orientation has been from Wilbur, but recognizing that there's this whole lineage of looking and leaning in that direction. Wilbur's frame is to see things from the point of view of, of perspectives, that we recognize whatever we're engaging with is an enacted perspective 
fundamentally. And that if there's anything beyond that in terms of its ontological reality, it's really hard to get at that. <laughs> we can only we can only really look at it as an enacted perspective. Um, so I think there's value in that. My early interpretation of Wilbur's work was that he was really trying to move beyond metaphysics, but the more I studied what he was talking about and the more I engaged with other emergent fields, such as reinvigorations of metaphysics and speculative realism and object-oriented ontology and things like that, um, the, the resurgence of Whitehead, I recognized that there's still a great value in metaphysical thinking and speculation, and we can't get away from that. So a post-metaphysical approach is just one that has a certain attitude towards all of that. Uh, it wants to distance itself from past metaphysical models that seem no longer adequate. Some, one of the metaphysical assumptions that's come under critique on, through Heidegger and through Derrida and others is the metaphysics of presence. And you know the idea that, that we simply behold things as they are and our metaphysics describes reality as it is and we've just got one-to-one -one correspondence theory of, <laughs> of truth. An active epistemology doesn't allow for that. It, it, it recognizes that what we perceive is enacted and constructed and socially conditioned in some ways. And we've always got to be careful about that. So it's more like an attitude. You could say an a categorical imperative to hold metaphysical claims in suspension within the, within the field of justification. I looked at the website description of what your talk is supposed to be. And it had a couple of phrases that stood out to me that I thought might be interesting to play with. One of the phrases was, uh, what paths lie ahead for religion and spirituality in the 21st century? And the question that popped up for me immediately is, it's the latter half of 2022. When do we stop thinking of the 21st century as being ahead of us? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. We're in the midst of it now, right? So, yeah. That's a phrase that I've had since the beginning of our forum, right? We did the Integral Post-Metaphysical Spirituality Forum, and that's a little blurb that I wrote up for that. And that inquiry has been going on for a long time. Now we're in our dialogues with John Verveke, and we're looking at the potential for a religion that's not a religion. Of course, from our own integral backgrounds, we've already been exposed to things like integral transformative practice and integral life practice, the notions of fourth turnings within Buddhism or other domains, um, different kinds of interpretations and reinterpretations of existing traditions. So, yeah, I think maybe even dating it is, is no longer appropriate, but we are in a time, and, and this is the language that's becoming popular across integral and metamodern and other spaces. Uh, to me, I look back at Skolomowski um, back in the 90s, Henrik Skolomowski talked about these different plateaus of thought systems. And there was Theos, and then there was Mekanos, and now we're emerging into something else. And in between the plateaus are these tangled thickets, these valleys and tangled thickets of a lot of creative flux before the next plateau emerges. And so he was saying that we are now, after Mekanos, we're now back into that, that dip and that creative thicket and flux before the emergence of the next plateau. He thinks one of the names for it would be the participatory age, or another name for it might be the evolutionary telos. Uh, but for him, those are the themes that are coming forward as, as something that's going to mark the mood and the orientation and the structure of whatever is emerging in terms of our religious and spiritual practice sensibilities. Another thing that was in that write-up was that you're going to discuss how the ancient wisdom traditions can be informed by modern, postmodern, critical philosophy, 4 e cognitive science, and things like that. And I think there's an interesting question around, from the point of view of the ancient wisdom traditions, why should they bother to be informed by these things? I don't think that they need to be. It depends on, on really 
what they're after, right? I mean, I, I think they've been serving their cultures in, in, in various ways fairly well, though I think there are things that we can look back at, you know, the old feudal structures of society under the religious rule in Tibet. Um, I think modern understanding has something to bring to that. And I think we can possibly create new cultural generative enclosures for ongoing contemplative practice that don't involve serfdom and things like that. So, I mean, I think there are gifts that we have from our time and, you know, different kinds of psychological insight, different kinds of developmental understanding, um, different insights from neuroscience. I think some of the stuff that McGilchrist is doing is interesting to look at. There are things that we could possibly get from these domains that can enhance practice. Um, I'm aware of, you know, for instance, some Blackfoot and other Native American tribes who are using virtual reality um, and immersive virtual reality and other things to not only preserve, but actually even transform and deepen some of their modes of storytelling and spiritual practice. And so far it's happening mostly within their own communities and it's not broadcast out to the public. But these are examples of traditions who are finding our modern developments useful for their own world building and culture enriching and self-development work. And I, I see that also in some of the teachers that I've worked with in the past. We had a dialogue on uh, dreams about uh, dream yoga, and I worked with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. And he comes from a you know long lineage of practitioners in the Mother Tantra and Dzogchen within Bun, and there's a super rich tradition. The more you get into it, the more you can be flabbergasted by how detailed it is and how rich it is and how many layers it already encompasses of human development and human ways of working with the world. And yet he's also finding a lot of value in talking to scientists, in talking to psychologists, in talking to leaders in education, um, to explore how innovations in those fields can also influence how he teaches, how he practices. Are there things that can you know, facilitate longstanding methods that had have been, you know, limited in some ways because of technology or limited in some ways because of our understanding of human systems that that can be you know empowered in new ways so i i think for anyone who's living in this time who has an openness to what the future seems to be unfolding and to the riches of the past it's a nice sweet spot to be <laughs> you know what what i think um paul vanderclay calls the estuary kind of the, the flowing together of these things into a, you know, create some enriched sediment and, and who knows what's gonna come out of that. So in addition to speaking about this uh, general attitude to spirituality and metaphysics that you and I have been promoting, you're also gonna do what they call an eye pause, <laughs> which is an opportunity to do a little bit of guided practice. Mm. So this is a, it's a nice, unique opportunity, and you've chosen to go with a subtle embodiment practice. Why did you make that choice? Why did you think it was important to use this opportunity to um, move toward the body in terms of practice? This is actually something that they asked of me. Mm. In fact, they even chose the practice. I guess she'd been listening to some of my videos, maybe in the TSK series, and she heard that I had been involved in Kumye. And so she said, would you be able to do some Kumye practice, three days of Kumye practice, introduce people to that approach? And at first I was a little bit surprised by the suggestion because I've loved Kumye. It's a beautiful practice, but it's not been a central one for me. It's been a supplementary one for me. I, I focus much more on time, space, knowledge, and integral spirituality and Tibetan teachings in terms of other Tibetan teachings, Kumye is a Tibetan teaching, but I focus more on Tantra and Dzogchen kinds of teachings. So I was a little bit surprised by it, but also actually delighted by the opportunity because in my mind over the last 
year I've been mulling on the creation of a course that I, I want to make. Um, I, I would have launched it within my own university if there was room for it, but there are certain things that I'm interested in that just don't quite fit in our program. So it's been in the back of my mind to create. And Kumye would constitute part of that course, not the entirety, but part of it. So I welcome this opportunity to really take some people into Kumye practices, describe some of the, the theory and uh, behind it, some of the methodology um, situated within a broader ecology of practices. What does it serve? What are its limitations? That sort of thing. Where did you learn this practice? I learned it in California with the Nyingma Institute and from different practitioners in this area. Tartong Toku, who created time-space knowledge, also put together uh, a pretty comprehensive Kumye education program, a training program. And they have regular practices on Sundays in Berkeley that you can go to. Uh, I've got the books on it and videos, so often I've just will do it on my own, um, read the books, um, watch the videos. And then as I've learned how to do the practices, of course, you don't have to go back to those resources, but you can keep you can keep doing those kinds of practices. Uh, but it's it's part of the suite of, you know, Tartong Toku is mostly, obviously, a Tibetan Buddhist teacher with uh, more focus on Mahayana and some Tantra, not so much focus on Dzogchen, but even though he is in the Nyingma lineage, um, which, where it has a, a rich, deep Dzogchen history. And then he's developed the time-space knowledge. And I've done both of those kinds of practices. Most of my Buddhist training has come from other teachers. And my TSK knowledge and my Kumye has come from Tartong Toku. I've heard it described as inner massage. Is that accurate? Yes, uh, it's an unusual idea and phrase, and it's not only inner massage, it's outer massage too. It, it is a, a system of self-massage or uh, receiving massage from others as part of it. It's also a yoga, so it's not only massage, it's breathing practices, it's internal practices, it's movement practices, um, and self-massage practices, and they all complement each other. Here's the crass tangential question. When I'm getting an inner massage, do I have to pay extra for an inner happy ending? <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely a happy ending massage for sure. Yeah. Uh, what in your experience of it over the years, what have you found are the general results of doing the practice? A lightness, a lightness in the being. I remember after a while of engaging with it, I didn't even make the connection initially, but uh, I started having the feeling that my body was a thought and it wasn't dismissive again. I, it wasn't attempting to just say, oh, the body is just an idea. It's not real. It was more that the light translucent quality of thought had permeated my body so that my body felt light and translucent in the same way, both, both here and not here, both. Yeah. So there's a quality to thinking that is both present and yet open. And that was my feeling of the body after some extended practice with this is feeling that yes uh, you know it, it is body it's a rich it's, it's a rich you know thing it's not dismissing it as an entity but that there was a lightness and a translucency to it that made it seem yeah altered it made it seem altered it makes me think of the origin story of the alexander technique which is that he was trying to cure an articulation problem and he was in the theater. And what he found was everything he tried to do physically to adjust himself was a little bit too much and kind of created a counter imbalance. Mm. And what he ultimately had to do was 
make very minimal mental adjustments within his body to release as a thought inside the physiology. And it became this entire technique. Have you experimented with the Alexander technique? Years ago. Yeah, I did. I, I got interested in that. And I got interested in Feldenkrais and um, Alexander technique. And But that was in my college days. And I was also doing some drama and things like that. And often people who are doing drama experiment with those techniques. Um, but I became interested in that. I became interested in that. And uh, I think it was Swami Rama. He had a book on non-moving yoga, where you you basically lie down and then you move through the body and you do different things and, and increase tensions and 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 interrelate different aspects of the body, you know, in an overall program. So you don't move it, but interiorly you do that. Right. Similarly, when I was at the Krishnamurti School, I became interested in the teachings of Sean Klein, a really beautiful uh, Advaita Vedanta teacher and a musicologist and doctor. But he co he complemented his uh, teachings, you know, spiritual teachings on listening and presence and awareness and all of those things with the Kashmiri energy yoga system, which involved again certain different postures and movements, but not only the postures and movements, but attention to the energy field around the body. And, you know, like you'd hold your hands a little bit above the floor and feel feel the space in between the hand and the floor, you know, as the like a cushiony energy field that you can feel. And then as you get good at that, you can begin to expand that around the body and circulate it in different ways. So these kinds of practices were, I guess, precursors for what I began to explore later in Kumye and have some similarity with it too. In, in thinking towards an embodiment series, uh, there seems to be something like an ascending and descending uh, symmetry because there are techniques where you bring the mind to the body and there's a, I think, a fairly large emerging consensus around the role that the body and particularly the sensory motor and neuromuscular system plays in underwriting cognitive and affective and even higher spiritual types of experience that we may need to return to and enrich the body's capacity to move fully and take postures and modes in order to be able to think more fully and things like that. How do you... There's not a question here. I just wanted to presence that because it was leaping out at me. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I find both movements, both currents in Kumye, in the way that it works. On the surface, Kumye means a system of uh, self-massage and, and embodied movements. Literally, Nye means the flow of feeling that's translated as massage, but it's really, you know, if you do this and then you just feel your hands and you feel that, that flow and that stimulation within there, right? That's present all the time in the body in different degrees and diff degrees of subtlety, but it also gets obstructed, right? There are different ways of holding the body and the, you know, Reich and others have explored that, the body armoring, the muscular armoring, all of that can block the flow of that. But the nye is that flow of internal feeling. And it's, it's experienced as massaging. The more that it can circulate, the more that it stimulates the different centers and parts of the being um, and enlivens them and brings out their potentials, right? Kum, it's actually... If you spell out Kumye, it's S-K-U with a silent S, Ku, and then M-N-Y-E. And but they when they write it out, it's Kum Nye, but it's actually Sku Nye, <laughs> right? And that that Ku it means the body, but it doesn't only mean this body. It means the space of embodiment. It means the the, the embodied field, and you can you know, do experiments, you know, getting close to somebody and back to somebody and, and asking, when am I too close? 
and when you are too close is when you have entered their kum, when you have entered their field of embodied presence. Um, and some people have, they don't feel it at all, and, and they basically don't have any, you know, sense of kum that extends very far beyond them. So kum is not just the physical body, it includes that, but it's more this whole field-like medium for experience. And that kumye works with exercising the flow of feeling through the field-like medium of experience to make it more fluid, make it more continuous, make it more integrated, and ultimately expansive so that the kum basically merges out with the field, the, the greater field, and there's a, a deepened sense of participation with all of your environment. So yeah, that's that's the kind of the, the, the more esoteric side of what's meant by kum yang. So you're going to be teaching people to mm, yay the skum. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's I think there's a, a question we'll end up facing if we go forward on this embodiment series, and it's about the relationship between embodiment taken in a very general and even abstract sense of I have these different kinds of bodies, or I have the principle of embodiment itself, uh, which seems to open us to some additional dimensions of practice, versus the idea that that pulls us away from some very solid experiences of the body as the physical body, which our culture tends to overlook and which might be um, a necessary thing to privilege and emphasize at this moment of history in terms of moving practice forward. Can you give some examples for that? What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about, say, um, physical exercise or um, wrestling or dancing or things like that, or just to even physically uh, putting yourself in natural elemental environments. Right, right. And there's a tendency. Well, here's a good example, which is I've for a long time been a fan of Japanese Zen master Hakuin. And one of the parts of his autobiography concerns his success in Zen, but it led to his Zen sickness. He wasn't regulating his body properly, and he had to go to a Taoist instructor for that. And there, part of that instruction was to put all of your uh, attention in, in the hara or in the lower part of the body. And for years, I did that as a subtle energy sensation. And recently, I thought, Maybe it's more concrete than that. Maybe what I should have been doing is actually tensing that part of my body physically and relaxing the rest of my body, mm -hmm. right? And it's an open question because there's a lot to be gained from doing it subtly. But it may be that by doing it subtly, sometimes you miss a whole bunch of things that come along with actually doing it in, in a concrete fashion. And that maybe a lot of the instructions that come to us from our wise ancestors were much more concrete than we think they are because of our tendency to be uh, very fluid and abstract in our thinking. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it, it brings up something I need to say about Kumye, which is that it's a rich practice, but it's part of a suite of practices. So it's not really meant to be taken as your only uh, vehicle. Um, it can go very deep and it can go far. And there are advanced books and teachings around, you know, pretty high level tantric kind of stuff that you can get into with it. But it's also very practical and simple. And Kumye practice is... Some, something that can be done before or after physical exercise, um, before or after actually hiking or climbing a mountain, before or after doing more intensive yogic practices. So it is something that basically works with the body in terms of optimizing the body in terms of its overall embodiment within the world. It's not meant to be uh, a purely, you know, abstract thing, and it definitely is very physical. It actually involves tensing the bodies in different ways, uh, holding different positions, massaging the body, doing rapid movements, doing slow movements, leaning into stretches, 
different kinds of things like that. So there's a yogic quality to it. And then there's the massage quality to it where you're actually stimulating, physically stimulating the body in different ways, different different areas for different things. But yeah, it all works together. And it's it's really, you know, we can pluck it out and say, oh, this is my my new technique. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, you know, but within the in, you know, within the uh Tibetan systems, it's part of an ecology of practices, to use John's phrase. You know, it it has a place, it does certain things. You could get imbalances if you think this covers everything. So I just brought up a couple of um the reciprocal complementary questions that I think will end up framing an embodiment series if we go forward, among others. What would you be looking to that series to provide? What would you be really interested in having people come on and get into for an integral stage embodiment series? I would like one just for there to be an introduction to the variety of types of practices that there are. And I think just like you were suggesting, in terms of the way that we maybe segment things out. A lot of people, for instance, like my long relationship and friendship with uh, Edward Berch, how much he uses ballroom dancing. And actually my old friend, Steve Randall, who's a TSK practitioner, he also used ballroom dancing, not only as something fun and, it, it, and he enjoyed to go do and, and very physical and, and it involved a lot of coordination. It was a spiritual practice as well. And so to really look at, you know, deep, rich engagement with the body in multiple dimensions and how all of it can basically serve our the unfolding and the flowering of our human being and potential. I think one of the things that came up in our last talk with John was what's tended to happen with mindfulness. And we were talking, I, I had asked something about interoception and the loss of interoception within the culture. And he mentioned something about mindfulness and how mindfulness gets narrowed down to a certain technique. And then it even begins to bracket out the body. And there's just this repeated tendency in the West to, you know, especially Western spiritual approaches to bracket out the body in that way. So I think there's so much there that is nourishing, you know, um, in the body. And that and if we work with the body in intelligent ways, that's one thing that always struck me when I was at the Tibetan retreats was their very careful attention to how posture influences the flow of bayou, of, 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 of the wind within you and also of the mind and influences qualities of attention. And there were very deliberate kind of things that you would do in the middle of a talk or in the middle of a practice session to change the body, to stimulate the body, to move um, the body in different ways that actually supported different qualities and states of mind. And there seemed to be such a literacy around states and conditions of the physical body and interior states and their correlation and how to wisely use them and how often we are pretty ignorant about that. We don't have a deeply integrated knowledge of how mind and body really work together and, and they could be used in ways that support each other. So that's one thing I would like to see explored is to just bring out more wisdom about that so that we can really learn from what we're learning both in contemporary um, studies and deeply, you know, from these rich traditions, what can we learn from our, our bodies and, and the proper use of them? Um, the converse side, you know, conversely, the, the flip side of that is we also have in some postmodern context, the kind of a body only and that the intellect is is bad or the you know that oh that's just all head stuff that's all just you know abstraction and there's only a focus in in on the body so i would like to see an embodiment series that actually is open to the philosophical depths and to the and, and to the you know uh, more refined and subtle dimensions of experience and being and and the intellectual and the, and the metaphysical and other kinds of territories that 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 are are there and that can integrate them you know for me you know if we take embodied cognitive science seriously most abstractions are built off of embodied metaphors anyway so for me 
high level abstract thinking is just a subtle form of dancing with the body. There are so many different actually embodied neural networks that are deployed in that high level thinking. Um, so that that's some general ideas, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I'm, the ways in which the body underwrites our thoughts and our paradigms, I'm interested in um, bringing up and exploring more dimensions of somatic interoception as, as a key generator function for both healthy living, but also for wise life. I'm also really intrigued by the by postural alphabets. You know, I think about asana as the first layer of Patanjali's eight uh, tentacles of yoga. And there's a sense in which we we act like, oh, he means the the standard repertoire of moves you would see on the cover of a contemporary Western yoga book, the asanas. Mm -hmm. But asana is a very broad term. It can mean any kind of um, uh, thematic postural hieroglyph, let's say. Right. And those may be letters of an alphabet, and it may be that our alphabet is impoverished. And yes, we need to try certain yoga moves, but we might be able to um, approach this through theater and improvisation and through different kinds of embodied engagements with other people or ecological circumstances. It may be coming out of the Gurdjieff background. One of the things that interests me is, is this notion of the transitional spaces between postures. Mm -hmm. As if we sort of, in our childhood, acquired a set of moves. And if you watch someone, they're always transitioning between one of their set moves. Yeah. And you sort of can catch them or you catch yourself halfway between two of your postures. Um, it's like you discover an, you know, a 2.5 is found in that space. And you think, okay, if I were to enrich my repertoire of physical postures and to be able to experience the breathing and the energetics and the mentality and the emotional frame that goes with that, would I then be able to enrich my overall understanding and engagement with reality, right? Is it rooted in that core physiological and gestural vocabulary? I think that's important to explore. Yeah, I agree. And I did some practice years ago uh, at a Vipassana ashram or Vipassana monastery in Malaysia. And that discipline was a pretty rigorous one. It was about 18 hours a day. And everything had to be done in slow motion. So you would have regular sitting meditation, but you would also have, you know, walking meditation. But when you ate, when you showered, when you did anything, comb your hair, you did it at at least one fourth of the speed that you normally do. And to do 18 hours a day of that slow motion movement, you definitely discover both your templates and a lot of things in between, right? And it was really, really eye-opening and a beautiful thing. And sometimes some even, I don't know how to say it, even some kind of miraculous kind of seeming coordination of events seem to flow out of that in terms of physical interactions and things that I, I can't even describe, but there, there, there came to like a, a feeling of like a harmonization of elements of the body with the environment. That was really interesting. And on the interoception piece, you know, I, I think that's one thing that I'm valuing about Kumye, and that's a big part of it, is that it really does help to develop the interoceptive capacities. But there's something about it that you know, there's, a, there's an impression in the West, typically, especially pe among people who don't have that much familiarity with, with Buddhism or, or Eastern practices, that this tradition is world denying and body denying. And that, uh, that the, you can just think back to the Theravadan meditations on the disgustingness of the body, you know, and you imagine the body full of pus and you imagine the body dying and you try to generate maximal disgust for the physical form, right? So there is that strand within Buddhism to try to push you into, uh, you cut through identifications with certain things. And it, but you find elements within you know, Tibetan teaching and, and Kumye that seem almost non-Buddhist in their celebration of the beauty of the body and the richness of the senses and the nourishment that a healthy body 
can bring to your overall well-being when the elements in it are circulating and well integrated. And there's a strong focus in in Kumye of integrating mind and heart and body and energy and bringing them together in different ways to again create and accumulate and then expand these flows. Um, so there's a yeah a lot of yeah a couple of different things here, but one is you know there's this emphasis that the senses have so much more to them than we recognize if we could really exercise them from a relaxed, non-reactive place. There's so much more that they can communicate to us when you are using them from a non-obstructed ku, non-obstructed body, right? And that, yes, this is limited, you know, that that you can get lost in the bliss that Kumye can generate. Um, and there's a need to go beyond it. But this approach is not that the body is distrust, you know, is something that we should distrust and that it's a source of corruption. No, it's it's a source of incredible richness and nourishment and, uh, and, and capacity for experience and feeling. And there are ways that you can get sidetracked in some of it. And so you need to be flexible and you need to develop certain degrees of stability to be able to work with that and, and go beyond any kind of fixation and, and, you know, attachment to bliss or things like that. So that's, that's a, you know, I think a really interesting piece there. And it, it talks about, you know, how if the body is allowed to, you know, well, a, a couple things here, I guess I want to say. One, similarly to when we talked about dreams and we were talking about the question of whether it's more authentic and helpful to let the dream happen on its own and not interfere with it, right? Or whether you need to engage with it as it arises. And I think both you know, can be useful. In my experience, feeling and emotion, habitually, I've related to them as they're authentic when they're happening by themselves. If I'm generating them, they're not real, right? If I'm engaged in their production, that's not a real feeling. So there's a, a kind of a, a just an inbuilt bias that it's it's real and authentic if it happens to me, but it's not real and authentic if I create it, right? Kumye doesn't take that attitude. You know, it sees us basically at different levels. Maybe it's not ego, but it's different levels. We're creating this all the time. You know, it's an interactive thing that's going on all the time. And that, you know, when you are scanning the body and identifying different areas of feeling, there's a real sense of plasticity in Kumye about how you can do that. You know, a lot of time you're doing the physical exercises or the massage and you stimulate the body and then you sit still. So you do the activity, you do all that stimulation and, and stretching and, and yoga kind of stuff and massage kind of stuff. Then you go to the stillness and then you process the inner massage part of it. So it's you do the physical and then you process the inner massage part of it. And sometimes you use your imagination and other things to um, magnify what's going on. So you might notice a certain feeling in, a, in, in one area of your body. And then you just practice pouring that feeling back into itself so that you can actually accumulate it and so that you imagine it's feeling and you can make that feeling expand. So any place that you discover any kind of feeling tone in the body, you can expand it to fill the entire body. And eventually you can keep, keep circulating it keep accumulating it, keep pouring it into itself that it begins to feel like it's flowing out of the body. And so I see that as related to what you talk about as excess coherence or surplus coherence. There's this activity of working with, integrating, bringing together and feeding back into different aspects of the being that actually overall collectively generate this overflow, generate this overflowing quality of 
presence and energy and availability of the system to multiple dimensions of reality, right? So to me, that's that's a, you know, a really key thing in that. And, you know, they have a, a good a good system for looking at, you know, what are the typical kinds of distractions that prevent you from practice? And, you know, just laziness and, and um, you know, restless mind and predictable kinds of things. Two that kind of stand out to me that are interesting is one is relationship with your parents. That they would say, if you don't have a good relationship with your parents, your body is not going to um, be as open and responsive because your body is your parents. Your body is the your parent suit <laughs> that you wear. It is them, right? You know, and to a large degree, there's a this deep continuity of your body and and their being, and it doesn't mean that you have to love them or you know, you know, like them even, but you have to accept them. So there's a recognition that that we can't just practice subjectively, independently. That always ultimately we're intersubjective and the first place that you look is the relationship with your parents it actually will expand beyond that and other relationships will also interfere with your kum and the, the nye within the kum <laughs> um, but that's a key, a key thing to look at and then one other thing is if you don't know where you come from and you don't know where you're going if there's no sense of that it's much harder to do the work um, within the body. And so there's a sense of, yes, you know your family history and you know um, your job and, and your educational history and all that kind of stuff. But that's not what they're looking at, obviously. They're looking at more, a, a deeper intuition of, of yourself as an embodied being participating creatively in the universe. If you don't really have a visceral sense of that to some degree, it's harder to do the practice. But of course, not everyone has that. So the more that you get that, the more that that facilitates the practice. That question of people thinking authenticity as being what the system does when you don't do anything. <laughs> uh, it, in some ways, it seems like that's an artifact of modernity or maybe the 20th century. That there is this sense that, and I think for various reasons, like you're saying, the, the parental inhabitation of our own body, maybe we haven't had the right kind of domestic lineage transmissions that our ancestors used to have. Certainly a lot of people are growing up in urban environments where they don't have the normal physical interactions with other creatures, animals, and environments that we used to have. We're in a situation where a certain type of abstracted left brain thinking is economically and institutionally privileged. And we're just encountering all kinds of stressors on a regular basis that we didn't have before. So there was definitely a time period, it seems like, where the West considered the importance of Eastern wisdom to be about letting go, <laughs> not being stressed, releasing yourself, things like that. And that may have some real therapeutic value in this unnatural environment. But we're learning more and more scientifically, athletically, neurohormonally that without enough stress, your system ceases to regulate itself properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it is going to be important to get beyond that simple dichotomy between it's authentic when I don't do anything and not authentic when I do something to it, because you break down either way if you don't have mm -hmm. both those complements together. Right. Uh, thinking of the, there's a Zen tradition of talking about enlightenment as body mind dropped. And I always think, well, that means first you have to have picked up body mind, right? You have to have brought those two things together somehow. Mm -hmm. Timothy Leary had this uh, term neurosomatic, where he thought that was sort of the moment our culture is in. It doesn't mean that all of the wisdom can be boiled down to working with subtle aspects of the body, but this might be the cultural, historical, technological moment, uh, I think intensified by the fact that we use these digital devices and that reminds us of how out of our bodies we are. Mm -hmm. We're in a moment where it seems like we need to return to the body and, and to the nervous system's ability to inhabit and map the body differently. And we've been leaving this out to our detriment for at least several hundred years. And there's a lot more discoveries to be made. So I'm, I'm very excited about this series in that sense. 
And when I think about the recommendations Leary made, you know, it was the 60s and 70s, he was thinking of certain kinds of cannabis as giving you like a, a somatic high. He was thinking about the beginnings of what we would call extreme sports now, the desire to feel like you're zooming and flying and tingling and things like that. But he was also thinking about a pranayama and various other Eastern techniques for sensing and stimulating the inside of the body, of which kumyai obviously is, is well within that. And so it seems like it's it's an important way of instantiating a, a shift in our relationship to ourselves and also into the way we emphasize different things within wisdom traditions. I think the moment now is to emphasize the body a little more and to be able to nye or kum uh, is, <laughs> is an essential seeming practice, uh, a way of a, gen a, a way of eliciting a, a more general skill set that we need, let's say. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. And you find that being picked up in Slaughterdike too, I think. And with his emphasis on, you know, general disciplinics and, and what he calls, you know, human beings as the ascetic species, but really he looks at athletics and Olympics and dance and things like that as a key part of the overall suite of things that traditionally has gotten looked at mostly as contemplative disciplines and meditation and yoga and things like that. But for him, he sees all of that as part of this essential vital practice field for the human being um, in its becoming in all of its dimensions. And uh, that, that much more of our education needs to encompass, you know, uh, that richer palette. Anything else we need to say about this? Where would people, if they see this video in time and they're interested in checking out the Stanford project that you're going to be involved in, where would they go to find out about that? Um, I'll link that in the description below. Um, it's basically, you know, contemplation by de design. It's part of the Stanford University website, um, but there's a, a URL for that that I'll put in the description. Fantastic. I feel great. I feel tingly. I think this went very well. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. And I'm, I'm actually really looking forward both to, to that Stanford event. I, I think it'll be very interesting to see what kind of feedback I get from the people who attend. And I'm really looking forward to the embodiment series. I think it's it's a beautiful thing, an important thing. It's I, It has the potential, in my view, to be like our sexuality series, to invite maybe a broader range of people than we're normally getting and, and to be pretty engaging. So looking forward to that.